Welcome to the Soil Matters podcast, everyone. I'm going to jump right off because Leighton and Av and Lindsay are the stars of the show. So peace out, guys. We'll see you in the background. Thanks, Ken. Thanks, Ken. Av, why don't you go ahead and introduce Lindsay? Because, all right, I will. <laughs> <laughs> Myself. Av, you frozen up? Av, I think your audio is gone. Are you there, Av? I don't think he can hear us. I think he's in a whiskey stupor. <laughs> can okay. you hear us? Ken, can you? Lane, can you hear me? I can can now, you? but for a minute there, you didn't seem to be working. But, but we can't hear each other. Or is it just me? I okay, think it's jump just off you. and back okay. on out. <laughs> All right, Lindsay. Soon, well, I'll, I'll turn it over to you, Ken, uh, Ken and Clayton. All right, <laughs> sounds good. Well, Lindsay, usually we start the show by introducing you and, and having you tell us a little bit about your story, your background, and how you ended up here. So why don't you go ahead and uh, give us a whirl? Yeah, how I ended up here. Um, well, it's been a long journey with cannabis. I started growing, I was probably 20. I was just a little, a youngin. Uh, growing outdoor up in uh, northern BC, uh, got into that, did that pretty intensively for for several years. Took a bit of time off after that wrapped up. The sort of the bottom fell out of the outdoor market, and I moved down to the coast and did an industrial design degree. And then uh, my sister Sarah, who you guys know, uh, she was in the Kootenays a, a couple years before I was, maybe three years before I was, um, and she was growing indoor. She kind of got into that scene here and I finished my degree and was kind of looking to get out of the city and found my way here. And uh, the first thing I did was uh, help reno a project to turn it into a living soil project. Um, and then it's sort of been full steam ahead from there. I've been growing indoors living soil intensively for the last four and a half, almost five years, I think now. And yeah, just day in, day out, it's been an amazing learning experience. Uh, I've done some outdoor on the sides, uh, but my main focus has been indoor. I'd love to sort of get back to doing some outdoor eventually here and uh, also growing some food and growing some other things. It's been very cannabis intensive, um, but it's been it's been great. And uh, it's just such a journey to continue to learn about uh, living soil systems and the plant. And it's it's humbling and it's amazing. And uh, the more you learn, the more you realize you don't know. A hundred percent on that one. Um, yeah, agreed. Um, so, you know, I, I'm going to throw a question out that I really love to ask uh, people um, that have experience and background in, in living soils. And that is, in, in your mind, Lindsay, where does the soil end and the plant begin? Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, that's a tough question, especially when we get into things like endophytic bacteria and like there's just... The, the interface there is uh, is very nebulous. I don't think there is just one sort of hard uh, start and ending point. Um, they're so interconnected. I yeah, I'm gonna decline to, to uh, <laughs> have any any sort of hard answer around that. And and you you know you can get you can get esoteric about it, uh, and you can get technical about it. And uh, you know I think the answer is somewhere in the middle there. Uh, you can't you know you can't have you, the way that plants evolved too, like in, unless there was this very uh, intricate symbiotic relationship with with my, microbiology, then it's just it's it's impossible to have a plant. So, um, yeah, that's that's my non-answer, I guess. I love it. I love it. Uh, I've had so many people try to answer that, and you know, probably uh, the most difficult one to debate is, well, we can grow it in a hydroponic system with nutrients, and it's like so we don't need soil. And it's like, that's not the question. The question is, you know, in soil system, where does that begin? And then I'll always come back at a person that answers that way. And I, I say, yes, but there's still a rhizosphere, a coat around that root that's interconnected with the aqueous environment. So even though you answered that based on not having any soil, the answer is still the same. There is, there, there, there really isn't any ending and beginning point. It's, it's moot. It's 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 part of the system, and this this goes back to like understanding aquatic uh, organisms and uh, uh, fish. You know, 
specifically uh, amphibious as well. Uh, they have a slime coating, and that slime coating is critical to their survival. So it's it's very much a rhizosphere um, on the animal itself. It, it's allowing that animal to survive, metabolize uh, nutrients and minerals right out of the water column, um, and and functions in a very similar way uh, because that biofilm which is the slime, is actually a nutrient cycling system in itself. Um, you know, I don't know if you knew this, but one of the coolest things about fish is that, unlike any other animal on the planet, um, if you feed a fish one pound of food, it will gain something like 0.95 of a pound back, whereas a cow, you give them a pound of feed, and or 20 pounds of feed, they might get one pound back. So it's, it's you know, it, it that's kind of where your head has to go in, in – you know, those types of questions is like, well, there's so much more, you know, biogeochemical reactions that are going on that we'll, we'll, we probably can't even comprehend that answer, you know, at least not without something like an AI um, to kind of drive some of those data points to a point where you could kind of explain some of those processes. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the thing I love about living soil and living soil systems is like, and, and with all the great science that's out there, we're just scratching the surface. And it's, you know, I, I get bored easily. And this is something that I never get bored with, because I'm like, oh, now I'm going to focus on some chemistry. And now I'm going to focus on some biology and then the interface of the two. And it's just, it's, it's never ending the physics that the everything it's, it, you it's, very uh, helpful to take a multidisciplinary approach and a holistic viewpoint to this because it is nothing happens in isolation. And I, yeah. I love that about it. Yes. And, and I think finally we are at an age in humanity where interdisciplinary is common ground and more of a focus than it ever used to be. It always used to be about reductionists. I'm glad you. Uh, I'm glad you get that because it's critical. Ah, welcome back. Uh, you missed her intro and, uh, we were just talking about uh, the question of where where does the soil end and the plant begin? And I, I've never asked you this. Uh, you might have something, uh, a response to that that you'd like to share. Yeah, I you know what, what I teach my students and my apologies again. I think it's rural Nova Scotia or maybe it's just my lack of uh, technology, but uh, joining you by phone again. Um, what, what I often teach my students is that to me, the whole rhizosphere is is. Uh, uh, really the, the, that, that immune system of the plant, right? It's, it's the digestive system. It's the other brain of the plant. And, and, and so, um, yeah, it's, it's really hard to define where, where the plant ends and where the soil begins. Cause to me, it's, it is, uh, all in one. So. Yeah. I think we all agree on that one. <laughs> so Av, do you, do you, consult with Lindsay or, or is she just part of so, that? You know, I, if I was to do my proper intro of, of Lindsay, it was, it was going to be based around uh, first meeting her, her sister, uh, her twin sister, I believe, mm -hmm. um, at the Grow Up Conference in, in Victoria. And, and we had a masterclass session around living soil beds. And Sarah, uh, Lindsay's sister, spoke so eloquently, so knowledgeably about and so passionately about irrigation just irrigating those living soil beds. And it just, it wowed the room. Uh, people just wanted to hear more and more. And then Sarah introduced me. She said, well, you know, I've got this um, agronomy, ag agronomically geeky sister who would love to nerd out with you on soil. And so then I had the opportunity of, of uh, Leighton, you and I hosting those uh, little uh, LSO chats and and then once again being wowed by the the passion and knowledge of, of Lindsay and and thought wow this this is this is so important to get this information out there and um, really speaks to the whole citizen scientist uh, aspect as well so that uh, that was my introduction to Lindsay and so very grateful to have you on yeah it's it's great to get to know you Av I look forward to working with with both of you guys in the future I've. Uh, yeah, I've known of you for a while, and and right away Sarah was like, "Oh, you got to meet Av. You guys will, you guys will get along great." So, uh, and then that's been the case. So, hey. And and what what I like about the the whole LSO world is that is that we we come from it from different areas, and 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 we get to exchange a lot of 
different theories and see how other people have applied those. Um, so whether you come from like an Albrecht approach or Reams approach or Steiner mm -hmm. approach or, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Vandana Shiva approach, um, Elaine Ingham approach, it's, it's interesting to see where, where people take those ideas and stuff. And so that's what's the beauty of, of having these sessions and chatting and being able to, to get different people's perspectives on, on what they're seeing, uh, and, and, uh, experimenting with. Yeah, it's always really helpful. I think, you know, even when we, we try to take a really holistic uh, approach, it's it's easy to get kind of sucked into, uh, you know, what we're doing in the way that we're growing. And it's important to, I think, zoom out a lot. And that that's very helpful when you have other voices around you and, and you know, just kind of nerding out about different techniques and, and theories and uh, sort of the intersection of the two and it's yeah it's it's really great i i have uh really enjoyed being part of your chats and sort of just expanding my community i've, I've worked in in isolation a fair bit or or with a very small group of colleagues and it's nice to be expanding that and just to be to be learning from others and hearing other voices and being connected in that way do you do you mind uh lane did you have a question no no go ahead Al. I, I was just wondering, do you mind sharing a little bit of that evolution of of growing uh, in, primarily indoor cultivation? Um, what did you start out immediately uh, with with super soils and then and so on and so forth? But yeah, yeah. When we started, uh, I belong to uh, the Living Soil Collective. So there's a, a group of projects and Sarah manages uh, a project or, and her own project within that. So we, we started, uh, off with, I would call it a super soil. What I would actually call it is a, a not very balanced, uh, hot soil, uh, that was loaded up, you know, and the first couple rounds were like, oh yeah, okay, this, this can produce. And then, uh, we didn't really know much about soil chemistry. Uh, we were sort of getting into soil testing, but pretty new in that journey uh, and, and learned very quickly that there are some real uh, challenges to managing uh, chemistry in a living soil. Uh, there was a lot of sort of inconsistencies and a lot of uh, quite a steep learning curve in terms of uh, managing what inputs we were using and in what quantities. I, uh, it, it's always been a real, I love soil science and I love uh, mineral balancing and learning about different people's approaches. Uh, that's been an area that is just, yeah, something that I have have uh, gotten into pretty extensively. And there's more than one way to do it. And, and you know, in terms of, you know, whether we're focusing more on the PACE test or on, on the Malik 3 test, or, and ideally sort of both and seeing those line up. But it was, it was quite a it's been quite a journey uh, in terms of the evolution of our soil. We have been running the same soil for uh, over five years and we've, you know, we've never dumped our soil. We've never had to start again. We've definitely gone through an evolution in terms of how that soil has performed, uh, sort of the aeration component of that soil. Nitrogen is a huge challenge uh, and, and sort of dialing that in for your cultivars. Uh, we had some issues with uh, sodium buildup and osmotic stress, which is a, a huge thing to manage in these systems where we're not watering to runoff. Uh, and yeah, and it's been it's been a great learning process, and so sometimes a a hard one and a steep learning curve. Uh, but it's yeah, I think we've done really well with with our journey around that and and coming into more balance and and always more to learn and and always. Uh, a ton of challenges that present themselves uh, in terms of the inputs available, uh, sulfites, uh, sulfites being a being a huge challenge. I think, especially in Canada, where we don't have access to a lot of inputs that are that are not sulfate based, and it's uh, just because cannabis can tolerate a high sulfur load doesn't mean it's best for a living soil system. So yeah, sodium and sulfur and nitrogen. There's there's lots of lots of lots of different challenges. Um, phosphorus has been a a big challenge and how to facilitate that uptake. And uh, yeah, we, we continue to learn a lot, and it continues to be a journey. And and I I love looking at soil tests and nerding out and analyzing them. And yeah, it's just something that I I find really interesting. 
Thanks, Ad. That was the question I was going to ask. <laughs> was what? What are your practices? What? So, how are you dealing with some of these challenges, Liz? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, it it's you know the approach that we took at first was what I would call fairly heavy-handed. Um, it's kind of like you know throwing a bunch of things at the wall and seeing what sticks. As we've refined our process, we become a lot better at dialing that in. Um, using more of a diversity of inputs, smaller smaller quantities of more things uh, tends to be a good strategy that we've adopted. Um, yeah, really trying to uh, not have excesses. I'd, I'd rather have a deficiency than an excess because that is much easier to correct. Uh, at points, uh, not not commonly, but there was a point uh, in in a room for me at the project I manage here that I I flushed because my sodium was too too high and I was seeing a lot of osmotic stress and so I sort of had to reset the bed. Not something I recommend like having to do often. And now I know how to prevent that. Uh, but before I, I you know wasn't really aware of the buildup that can happen. Uh, and the impact and, and and understanding the numbers more when you get your tests back and, and and looking at something and being like, oh yeah, that's fine or ooh, I gotta I gotta track that or trend that or that's you know getting into a bit of a danger zone. I might have to readjust uh, the inputs that I'm using uh, or any number of variables that are that are going on in the system uh, and just tweaking tweaking those things and sort of getting a better comprehension of what are those dials that you can adjust. Uh, and your cultivation practices and and how those all sort of interface to hopefully have a successful round and then many successful rounds after that there, there's the gold, gold bars from from ken <laughs> um so i i it, when you when you say you needed to flush was that was that based on looking at a base saturation of sodium or or an ec level or or was it just watching the plant and saying wow there's something going on here yeah, I mean, it was it was largely sort of what we were seeing in the grow, but then reflected in in the numbers, specifically uh, elevated sodium, went a little hard on the fishbone meal, uh, and that, I have a love hate relationship with fishbone meal. I, I and now I do use it in small quantities and and have seen some very good effects. Uh, but if you overdo it, just like anything from the ocean, oyster, shell flower, whatever it is, uh, you can really elevate your sodium very quickly. Uh, and we don't water to run off. So there's really nowhere for that sodium to go. It can move down through the soil profile a little bit. But uh, if that builds up um, and if you, you know, and then say maybe your potassium levels drop a little bit or something happens and you can you can have a pretty dramatic effect on the plant. So uh, we had had sort of, we, you know, it, it took about two years for that buildup to happen. It wasn't like it happened overnight or in the first couple rounds. Uh, and it was something that I wasn't uh, as aware of nearly as I am now around tracking and, and really uh, understanding the impact that that can have uh, on, on your plant's uptake of other nutrients or lockout, um, osmotic stress that can happen. So. Yeah, I only ended up doing it with one, my small flower room here and uh, had pretty good effect. L luckily, when uh, those tables were built, uh, Sarah actually, she, she designed them and she did put a drainage in there so that, you know, which I was like, I'm really glad that this is possible. It's not a fun job. It's, uh, it's labor intensive. You got to be really careful. You, know, you gotta run your your dehues a lot after you don't want that soil sitting saturated and becoming anaerobic um, but it was it was the right call and we saw a big improvement after that and and since then i've been able to sort of track that and manage that and, and understand uh, what i can do so that there isn't that sort of sodium buildup happening in the system so um you're you're not a a fan of having excessive sulfates i'm not i'm really not so you didn't use gypsum? We do, we do. I use gypsum. No, sorry. Did you, did you use gypsum in in your flushing? Oh yes, I did. So I amended pretty heavily with gypsum um, beforehand. Yeah, gypsum's great. I, I'm not I'm not anti sulfates. I just uh, everything in moderation. And and gypsum's great. And especially if you want to be pulling other cations out of the system or displacing them on the clay colloids or organic matter colloids in your living soil system, you have to. 
uh, replace them, like replacing them with calcium is a good thing to do. And then you can also, you know, you just flush that out. It really helps precipitate sodium uh, out uh, downwards from the soil if you if you add some gypsum first. So anyone who is in a position who who needs to be flushing their beds or is considering flushing their beds because of some excesses, uh, add some gypsum in there first, and that will that will really help. In, it's last question, Leighton, I'll turn it over back to you. But just looking for some specific numbers, um, most of our, our viewers probably use either Logan's, Logan Labs or, or using a &L Labs, mm -hmm. um, probably doing both the saturated paste and, and or soil carbon test. Do, do you have any numbers where you say, oh, well, my, my sulfur is getting way too high now, um, I, I should check it? Or well, sodium? Sodium, yeah. So, sulfur, sulfur is a different one. I'll address sodium first. Uh, you know, if sodium's creeping towards three percent on the base saturation, I'm like, ah, shit. Like, and I don't, I don't panic because it, you know, I'll kind of, I'll trend it over time if I see that trending upwards. Um, and it's also because it's part of the base saturation. It's in relation to your other cations. Uh, so depending on what's happening there, you know, if you somehow you're like, oh, crap, like my, my calcium's really low or my, my potassium's really low, that's automatically going to increase your sodium number on, on that test. Uh, but I don't like it, you know, preferably I like to see it, you know, around one and a half percent, even, even under that as low as possible. But as soon as it starts to creep up over two, two and a half, three, I'm like, ah, that's not good. Like we gotta, we gotta mitigate that for sure. Um, sulfur is different. Sul sulfur, like cannabis plants, can tolerate very high sulfur levels and and not sort of exhibit any sort of catastrophic effects. But it just, I I have found it can really impact uh, phosphorus uptake, uh, and it just it kind of just throws the system out of balance. Like cannabis really doesn't need as much sulfur as some people think it does. Yeah, I, I don't think it's ever uh, something that I I plan. Uh, I just know that it tends because using potassium sulfate or using uh, magnesium sulfate or calcium sulfate, we just seem to get our sulfur levels uh, higher than than desired, and and definitely do run into that problem of um, whether whether it's a high pH or excessive sulfur, we we tend to see that phosphorus lockout. Um, I just wanted to mention that with with all of the living soils, I think I've I've helped design. I don't think we ever get lower than three percent base saturation of sodium. So, really? so uh, yeah, I think we Where's start that? out at that level. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, it's uh, and like I said, it's in relation to you know what what other levels of, of cations you have in there, how that's going to impact you, you. You may see three percent sodium and and not see any negative impacts at all. But if you're if you're low in other things, then you're you're going to see that. And if you you know, if you have excess sodium too, like the plant's going to dump potassium into the system to try and dilute that. And that's going to cause problems as well. Uh, plants are ingenious in how they, how they deal with excesses. But if we're trying to grow, you know, top shelf living soil flower, it's, uh, we want, we want to set them up for success. Well, uh, you're, I think we're finally clicking because you're asking the same damn questions that I was going to ask. So thank you. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, and then the one question I was going to uh, also kind of uh, tweak a little was um, what other sources of calcium do you guys have access to up in Canada on unlike gypsum? Yeah, well, you know, oyster shell flour, I, I like in again, in moderation, you have to be careful with that. It's it's slower release. I like to have a diversity of inputs, some that are more soluble and some that are less soluble. So that hopefully you sort of balance it out and you and you always have these nutrients available you don't sort of have a have a big availability and then a crash and then like it's all about like trying to maintain that thermodynamic equilibrium that that equilibrium in the system uh that is that's become more and more my focus and my goal the more that i learn about uh about living soil systems and about redox chemistry and uh, and the microbiology and how they all they all interface together. I'm just like, okay, every time I, I look at my plants, I'm like, okay, what can I do to help maintain equilibrium for you guys so you don't have to work so hard? You know, that was, uh, uh, again, wonderful that you point that out as slow release uh, as well as fast release. And, and that was exactly why I asked that question on calcium. 
um, we've we've recently been able to start um, purchasing like amino acid digests of calcium, which are incredibly uh, quick acting. Um, unfortunately, they're sold similar to the hydroponic shops. It's five percent calcium, ninety five percent inert, which is just it, it's highway robbery. But yeah, it, it's a tool. It's a tool. Yeah, I'd lo love to see more uh, amino based chelates that are that are higher percentages of the minerals that we actually want and not just a bunch of, of water weight. It's, you know, the chemistry is, is involved. Uh, I'm really curious. Uh, I, I have, I have used, and I'd, I'd like to use more, um, the, uh, rooted leaf agritech CalMag fuel, uh, that Nick has developed. It's not available in Canada. I know Nick's working really hard to get his products approved for, for Canada. But uh, it's, yeah, that guy knows his, uh, his biochemistry and uh, Rooted Leaf Agritech, they're, they're doing some really cool things. So uh, that's something to follow too. Yeah, bio, bio uh, ag chemistry is, is really the key for some of these uh, corrections because you can make them very quickly. And then, like you said, you just let the slow release uh, move in after that. Um, yeah, I, I like like to have have that diversity, and, and then you know, in formulating your liquid feeds, like you know, you, I like my soil to be balanced with a with a multitude of inputs: slower release, faster faster release, uh, and then and then liquid feed is a whole other thing. Like those soluble nutrients, I think, are essential, and you you have that soil nicely balanced and sufficient so that you're never tanking. But uh, you know, li liquid feed. And, and using the aminos and, and using different forms, you know, maybe you're using some soy hydrolysate, whatever it is, uh, hopefully, hopefully things that are very bioavailable to your plant. So you can kind of just, you know, like we, we push those plants hard, especially under LEDs, like you, you cannot let those plants uh, get deficient or it will be very hard to catch up. Um, have you ever played with potassium silicate? I wish that we could get ag cell 16 here. Uh, as as a dry input, uh, yes, and I and I have in in some liquid formulations. Uh, I don't love how quickly it can precipitate out in some solutions, but I I wish like I really really wish we got egg cell sixteen here. Uh, so again, sort of reducing those sulfates. You know, potassium sulfate is great and it has a time and place, but uh, when we're just using that. Uh, it's it's very easy to build up the sulfate and again and then you know we're we're taxing that plant's energy it needs a lot of reduction power to reduce those sulfates they're highly highly oxidized so uh that that becomes a very energy intensive process for the plant so anything we can do to minimize that uh is is great wow you, you i love what you've been doing i mean you obviously dove down the rabbit hole pretty deep on these relationships and balances um, which is so important um, so, Av, I'm going to turn that back to you and, and formulate another question. <laughs> well, don't well, don't well, steal it this time. <laughs> or, or, or questions, they just keep they just keep flowing. Um, so, uh, you talked about sol soluble uh, nutrients. Are are you also using any foliars? Oh yeah, I yeah. foliar my fucking life away. Uh, wow. <laughs> no, I foliar a lot. I. I'm a big fan of foliar nutrition for uh, for living soil systems. I think it's a great shortcut to get nutrition to your plant uh, when you want to deliver it right to the phylosphere. Uh, yeah, anything like calcium and silica, um, anything, magnesium, because I don't like that to build up too much. I'd rather run lower levels of magnesium in the soil and supplement that uh, by foliar feeding. Uh, there, you know, there's just some, some little tricks that you can do, but I, I foliar feed a lot. And are you basing this? I, I, I'm, I'm having this assumption that your plants never look really unhealthy and therefore, how are you determining whether you need to do a foliar application of something like a silica or even a calcium? Cause I can't imagine you actually having calcium deficiency. So what is are you doing tissue analysis sap analysis uh, yeah we'll do we'll do tissue analysis i like to correlate my tissue analysis at flip to uh to a soil test too so i can sort of get an idea of what's happening in that moment you know it, it is just a snapshot of of what's happening at that time uh yeah surprisingly you, you know 
calcium and phosphorus, you know, you're like, oh, you probably never have calcium issues. And like, well, yes and no, because the more that I've tried to push phosphorus, uh, they don't play nicely in the soil of phosphorus and calcium. And they can really lock each other out. And the more, and you're like, oh, I'm going to push one really hard. I really need to like up one or the other. And they can, it can really have a negative impact on the uptake of, of that other nutrient. They combine very readily. Phosphorus just wants to combine with everything and precipitate out. So that is challenging. Uh, you know, everything that we do in the system affects something else. Nothing ever happens in isolation. So you have to sort of you know, piece it together and be like, okay, what could this potentially impact and, and how can I how can I mitigate that? Uh, so foliar feeding is a great way just to sort of cover your bases. Uh, if I get a, if I get a t leaf tissue test back and, and there's something specific that's really low, I can I can uh, sort of target that. Or uh, conversely, if there's something in excess, I can I can take it take it out of uh, we, we've used the soilscapes uh, program, so it's like it's a million things. It's it's definitely my little chemistry set. Like you, you you can, but the great thing is you can you can mix and match, and you can target specific nutrition if you are if you are lacking something specifically, or you can kind of do a full fertility approach and and uh, go that way. Can you explain a little bit more about the soilscapes? I'm I'm not familiar with that. Yeah, so it's a it's the plants really like it. It's it's labor intensive. You can't pre-mix anything. So it's a bunch of uh, individual amino acid chelates of individual nutrients. Um, biomin is... Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, amino biomin. Yep. <laughs> uh, and there's a few other components to it as well. So I, I've actually, we have uh, like syringes that all fill up with like, oh, it needs like two, two mils of, you know, copper and this and that. And then I have little packs, I call them my little foliar packs. So I pre-make those or I get my staff to pre-make those. Uh, so they're all ready for me. And they're sort of one that's more of a vegetative and one that's a bit more transition. Uh, so those are great, uh, but I also like that you can take the individual components of, of that system and, and use it that way as well. Uh, I like to foliar a lot of aloe and fulvic, just, you know, you can't really go wrong with that. You're like, here's some carbon, like have fun with that. The plant's never going to not want that. So. Yeah. I didn't, I can't believe that you can get that up there. I thought that was manufactured down here in California. It, it is. It's hard to like, you, you can get the thing. The thing is like, we can get things in Canada, but uh, you pay a lot of duty and a lot of shipping. So it can be cost prohibitive. Uh, and, and a lot of things are not necessarily uh, Health Canada approved, even things like uh, organic amino acid chelates. It just, it just it's, it's all about the regulatory system. And Ab, you probably know a lot more about that than I do, uh, but it, it can be a challenge. So yeah, just being a Canadian grower, like procuring the right amendments and the right inputs uh, is a challenge in itself. I'd, I'd love to see it be more streamlined so that uh, Canadian growers are not uh, faced with with this challenge. Yeah. So um, you talked about uh, these, you know, foliar applications are you always adding in fulvic when you are amending a nutrient or do you just do a nutrient and then your fulvic? Uh, i like to add fulvic all the time yeah uh it's yeah you can't really go wrong adding some a, a high quality fulvic acid uh plant for plants carbon is everything and and feeding them fulvic acid will will only help in uh, the biosynthesis of all of the things that we want them to produce. So, uh, yeah, and, and it's great for, uh, you know, if you have any sort of adverse reactions uh, around your, your mineral chemistry there, it can help uh, mitigate that as well. Yeah, and it's an amazing tool to deliver to intercellular mm -hmm. uh, because it's such a low atomic weight and, and because it's an acid, it will consume or, or allow um, these minerals uh, or nutrients into it and then deliver it right into the cell. And that's why I asked that question, because again, you're, 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 you're way ahead of the curve in a lot of these guys that, that don't understand about intercellular delivery. So uh, mm -hmm. kudos to you. There's another gold bar, Ken. Yeah. Um, what about any uh, natural farming inputs to, to offset some of these uh, 
you know, what I call quick response, quick plant response uh, deliveries. <laughs> yeah, I've definitely experimented with uh, some FPJs and, and doing some different ferments. I have found fairly good success with that. I've since moved away from that one. Uh, it's very labor and time intensive and I don't, I'm already pretty maxed out as it is. Uh, and two, the more I learn about uh, the biology and about, uh, you know, I just, I, yeah, I've really shied away from doing any anaerobic fermentation at all. Anything anaerobic, I'm just like, no, I'm just gonna not because of the potential fallout of that if it if it wasn't done correctly or depending on the balance my microbial balance in the system i just want to do everything that i possibly can to promote aerobic activity and so even the faculty of anaerobes that i know a lot of people are a big fan of and and you can you can have good success with labs and, and a bunch of different things uh i just i'm i'm much less on that train right now again i think there's a million different ways to grow weed and i think there's a lot of uh a lot of good benefits that can be had, but it's a it's a variable that I want to eliminate in my own personal growing. So one of the biggest misnomers that that I noticed um, between the natural farming community and the soil food web community is that a lot of times that these these fermentation processes um, are being used strictly or straight from fermentation, whereas Dragonfly Earth Medicine's approach is to always re-aerate you know, and bring them back to the aerobic side. And I think that's like the missing link to so many of these uh, pitfalls that, that natural uh, that <clears throat> soil food web community has against the natural farming community is that they don't they don't understand that they can very quickly flip an anaerobe into an aerobe uh, using oxygen or uh, you know just natural bubbling. Or start. How does it? Maybe you can help me understand a little bit more how that works, Layton, because I'm really curious about that. Because, you know, we can brew a tea with a, with a bunch of aeration, and we can overdo it, and it, it goes anaerobic, and we're you know we've bred a bunch of things, even though we've been pumping it full of air the whole time. So how does that? How does the? How does that work? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I'll try not to go on a rant here, but bottom line is that. We have a thing called BOD, biological oxygen demand. Um, if that point gets oversaturated to the point where the biology in the water column is greater than the supply of oxygen in the water column, there's your crash. That's why when whenever you're doing, or whenever I advise somebody that wants to learn how to do compost teas, I said 30 hours is your max. And the reason why is you put one ounce of molasses to 20 gallons of water. Do not go over that. If you go over that, you're reducing that time back significantly. So if you follow directions and you use one ounce of molasses for 20 gallons of water, what will happen is at hour 24, your flagellates will begin to divide rapidly. And the reason why is because this is the prey predator theory. If there's so much food in the system, the predators are going to come. And when they come, they're going to start multiplying like crazy until all of a sudden there's no food left. And then they'll go into insist form, which means now you've got buddies ready to jump and go into war for you in the soil column. So even if even if you get past that, uh, you know, 30 hour, you're not losing them yet. But at hour 36, you're going to begin to have, again, a plume back of the biology which is going to crash that biological oxygen demand. So that's why I always tell people no longer than 36 hours. I don't care if some of the flagellates have gone in cysts. That's fine. As soon as they get put into the soil system, soil system hits the proper parameters. Those guys will come right back to work and get to work for you. Now, and how do you, how do you know that you're proliferating flagellates versus say ciliates? Like, well, cil that cil ciliates have to be in a zero oxygen uh, environment. Mm -hmm. So once you get that BOD up to a point where it crashes, now all of the aerobes are going to insist and go away and the ciliates are going to plume. Mm -hmm. And what the problem is the ciliates will eat the flagellates, especially if they're in cyst form. They're mm -hmm. just pockets of nuggets. They're, 
you know, chicken nuggets. Mm -hmm. So that's why we never like to see ciliates is because they're going to eat the arrows that we want to do our nutrient cycling system. Um, I imagine Leighton, you're also probably uh, looking at your teas under the microscope and making sure that they're, uh, that they are aerobic. So Lindsay, I spent 18 months and I was a maniac. Like I yeah. just was working like a dog down there mm -hmm. and, and I was testing every hour I was putting it under the scope and yeah. that's how I got these formulas. Yeah. And they were, they were, yeah, they were not easy to, to figure out. It was just trial and error, trial and error, trial and error. But I did have some um, uh, kind of advantage over most people in the regard that I was playing with a horribly anaerobic starting product called fish ship. Yeah. Fish manure. Now, not the company fish ship. I was yeah. going to different aquaculture facilities and taking their waste out of their waste streams. Sometimes it was settling ponds. Sometimes it was rotary screen filters. You know, you name it. Mm -hmm. um, I was playing with it. So there was certain types of uh, collections that I could never stabilize. Like I'd spend two weeks bubbling this stuff, and I'd increase the. I'd add another bubbler. So I was a uh, doubling the, the CFM delivery to the water column, to try to speed up the process. And that stuff, if you got it on your clothes, forget it. You had to throw it away. If you got on your skin, you reeked for two to three days. No yeah. problem. I don't care how much you scrub yourself. So I was quickly learned that, you know, there's certain levels that you just don't even want to play with. And by the end of it, I was able to, you know, work with the fish farmers themselves to increase the BOD or not increase the BOD, but increase the dissolved oxygen in their water column by removing some of these anaerobic pockets. Like one guy, I had him change all his sand filters. Uh, I had him switch from uh, the, the shaky little sketchy filter that he had to collect the solids into a rotary screen, a rotary drum screen filter. Those two changes in themselves dramatically changed all of this, all of the, the fish manure that flowed through it to a point where his fish health increased. Their fins got long, they got more vibrant, and he sold in a live market. So people would go into the grocery store in this uh, Chinese market and they'd pick the fish that they wanted filleted. So if that fish looked really good and healthy, he'd get more money when, when they purchased it. So he was like, oh, thank you, Lady. Thank you for all this. And I'm like, I didn't do it for you. I did it for me. <laughs> and now we had a great relationship. We could tease each other a lot. But I basically taught him more about understanding um, not water chemistry because he was a master at water chemistry. But he didn't have a clue about biological components and how they are functioning as equally as important in in the water column. And, you know, the way I got to his head was like, hey, dude, you know, the slime of the fish, right? Well, that's a system in itself that's protecting your fish. And if that if that slime or that biofilm is super healthy, it's going to make your fish super healthy. It's going to cut back the necessary feeds because you're overfeeding right now because these fish are not healthy enough to digest it as at the rate that they should be able to because of all of the anaerobic interactions in, in your system. And by th throwing more feed at them, you're making the anaerobics components even worse. So again, there was a lot of background to it prior to, you know, getting to the point of understanding where those sweet spots are with biological oxygen demand, dissolved oxygen in the water column, and then food sources of, of all different types. So, Leighton, if, if at a practical level, if, if somebody is is doing a, a fermented uh, plant extract, uh, perhaps using EM or doing some IMOs, would you be recommending that prior to application, hit it with some uh, some dissolved oxygen? Your lactobacillus, your bacillus species will probably maintain. If not, they may actually increase. But any of those other anaerobic uh, potential pathogens would, 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 um, uh, decrease. Absolutely. So, um, again, I was so blessed to work with Elaine and, and, you know, I would, I would bring her stuff that I had observed or, um, was, was, you know, curious about. And so she instantly started talking about some real important indicators like spirochete, spirillum, they're like little corkscrew type, uh, uh bacteria. 
And if you see those, then you know you're in a situation with potential pathogens, right? Because it's clearly in an anaerobic phase. So I would keep bubbling and bubbling until I got to a point where there were none of them left. And now I knew I was safely outside the zone of any potential pathogen. They can't survive in that level of uh, dissolved oxygen. And often it would be to the point where, you know, I want to, I want to do this quickly. So I'd put two blowers on a, on a brewer instead of just one. You know, again, I, I bought a bunch of different equipment. I was playing with, with equipment, vessels, food sources, biology, inputs, you name it. Because I, I wanted the answers to all this stuff. Um, so the other interesting component to this is that, you know, you get into gram negative and gram positive uh, bacteria. And what happens in, in, in an aerobic environment, um, gram negatives are going to die off. They're, they're going to just, they're going to implode. And the reason I learned this, it's called, it's called um, oxidative stress, right? So you oxidize something. So I'm going to tell the story real quick because I think it's important to understand. Um, Elaine was struggling with getting uh, her compost brewer to actually brew aerobic teas. And so she asked my advice because she realized, you know, I was playing with all this different equipment to try to figure out all this stuff. And I went down and looked at it. I go, well, your blower is inappropriately sized. You need a bigger blower to, to speed up that process because you're going to crash before you ever get to be, a, before you ever get the dissolved oxygen up high enough to kill all of the pathogens. And she goes, that's the problem, Lee. So I went, ah, I got it. I'm going to go use pure oxygen in, in a brew and see what happens, right? Because if I use pure oxygen, man, I should be able to turn that thing like in, in minutes, if not hours. I killed everything. Yeah, <laughs> killed everything, dude. So, so that's when I started to realize, oh, there is a balance to to this that you there's a threshold that you don't want to cross, and that chased me back to to Keith Wilda, and, and I asked him, I'm like, all right, what is the highest um, dissolved oxygen you've ever seen in a water column? And he said, well. We've gotten over 15, but anytime we get over 15, what happens is we start to literally burn the fish's eyeballs. So that's that's kind of a no-no uh, because they, they're they intensive aquaculture. So they use a lot of oxygen because they have so many fish stuffed into that small water column that if they did not use oxygen, they would lose the fish because the BOD would crash and everything would die. So, you know, that's why, again, having the right people in your tool belt, like my rule of thumb is always surround myself with people that are way fucking smarter than me and just shut up and listen, right? Don't talk over them. Don't ask them too many questions. Ask a question and then shut up and listen. And what I found more often than not, both the fact that they, that I'm asking a really good question and then I shut up and listen until they're completely done and then pick at their answer so that I make sure that I completely understand what they just told me. And by doing that, I've been exposed to or, or been blessed to have some of the most amazing um, advisors, uh, you know, on this planet for, for chasing down what nobody really had done before, which was trying to combine, you know, these aquatic microorganisms with terrestrial organisms and then create a product that you can apply to soil to quickly flip it around. So, you know, again, I was a man on a mission and I wasn't going to stop till I figured this all out. So I was very driven and, and by being constantly reintroduced to people, Oh, you lame. You gotta, or Hey, you, you gotta go talk to Layton up in the, in the, in the shop. He's working on this stuff right now. So, and then the scientists would roll in and, and we'd start chopping it up and, all of a sudden, I got a bunch of answers that I had un unasked, and and vice versa. So there's that you know that that synergy, that that uh, cross pollinization, uh, interdisciplinary work that allowed me to springboard uh, a lot quicker than than most people in a single discipline. So I, I kind of went on a rant there, uh, but I wasn't supposed to. <laughs> oh no, we love the rants, Layton. Don't <laughs> stop, brother. Okay. All right. Fair enough. So I hope I answered your question. But bo bottom line is when you get that DO up to eight parts per million, you are you are at the aerobic threshold. Don't cross 15. Um, and But at eight, you're safe. 
And what happens to the aerobes is they're either, or the anaerobes, they're either oxidized or they go into cysts and they become um, snacks. They become a biostimulant for all of the aerobes and vice versa too on the other side. When you, when you crash, now your good guys that are, are, are not strong enough to insist will get consumed or get oxidized, or not oxidized, digested. Literally, anaerobic digestion. That's like your stomach. So, so, so yeah. Lindsay, what, what are you doing for biology? Yeah, well, as Leighton has just alluded to, uh, compost teas are super dynamic. And, and uh, in order to get really good at them, you have to quantify them with the microscope. And you also have to you know, do a deep dive like Leighton has and, and really kind of distill down a very uh, streamlined formula. And that is that is predictable. Uh, so I do not do compost teas at all. I stick to compost extracts. Again, it's a lot of it is about eliminating variables. And I don't want to be wondering, um, you know, if I if I did this correctly, because my understanding, I don't have a lot of experience brewing compost teas, but my understanding is, is that they are incredibly dynamic. And, you know, if you don't catch it at just the right time, you can you can go in the opposite direction. So I stick to extracts. Uh, I, yeah, I, I just like straight up extracts. Um, I don't mess around with, uh, with brewing teas. Uh, it's also, and I don't want to clean brewing equipment, honestly, like there's, there's so much labor involved in just keeping things clean and sterilized that I just cut out that component, go right to using biologically complete compost, uh, do an extract and, you know, go from there. Where do you get biocomplete compost? Do you make it? Yeah, well, so that is my my next pursuit is I I really want to learn how to make it get good at making it if there's like I if there's one thing I can do for the planet, I feel like it's learn how to do that and learn how to produce that. I don't make it currently. Uh, yeah, it's it's going to be my next area of focus for sure. Right now in Canada, there's not very many places to get it. Again, it's there, there's um, a woman, Vivian uh, Docter is her uh, her company, and uh, I think she's around Montreal. Uh, this compost I actually got from a guy who had ordered it from her. Uh, he was in a Soyuz about four hours away from me, and unfortunately, his his project went out of business, and and we connected, and so I went down there and and. Uh, bagged it up and loaded it into my truck and, and drove it back uh, to the Kootenays. Uh, I know there's a woman, uh, I think her name's Jo uh, Root Shoots. Roots and Shoots. Oh, yeah, Roots and Shoots. Um, yeah, I don't know her personally. I'd, I'd like to connect with her. And I don't know what scale she's producing biologically complete compost at, but I know she is. she's doing some. She's a, she's in Vancouver, I think. Uh, so, yeah, so I'm, I'm not, uh, there, there's a real, there's a real opening there for, for people to learn how to do it. I think the best thing you can do is probably learn how to do it for yourself so you can, you know, grow food and, and grow your cannabis, grow your medicine. Uh, and I, re I really want to learn how to do that. Uh, but I, I, that's not where I'm at right now. Reliant is, on others. What is the price range of the biocomplete compost up there? Yeah, that's a great question. Like directly from Vivian, I know you can go to the Doctor website and uh, she has her prices there. I I can't recall off the top of my head. And again, shipping can be a a, a big a big cost for sure. I I want to say like it's got to be around a thousand bucks a cubic yard or something like that's, that. I think that's what the ballpark is because I I know that that's comparable to uh, Overton uh, Dale Overton with Eco Tea. Um, also has a as a biocomplete compost out of Manitoba. Okay. Um, yeah. And it's about a thousand a year. So Lindsay, uh, a, a good friend of mine, Jimmy Perkins, uh, this summer kind of forced me to um, record some of uh, the methods that I've developed over the years for building uh, biocomplete or biointensive compost. Um, and so we, we should definitely uh, exchange contact information so that I can get you some more on that. Yeah, and presently, there's I'm the sure. link at the bottom that she can get 20% off the chorus, and anybody else wants to take it, you know. Okay. Uh, highly recommend people do take advantage of that because you know that took me uh, a minute to develop that actual technique, but it's far more comprehensive than just compost building. Mm -hmm. So, we're using thermodynamics, we're using convection, we're using 
different forms of inoculation. Um, we're collecting, you know, diversity local to where your environment is. So it's very cost effective. Mm -hmm. I built an eco pile that would last you for a whole season in about three or four hours. Oh, wow. um, and you just build one in spring and then you build one in fall and then you're perpetual. And if you have the excess, you can either share it or put it in your garden or, or you know, give it to a friend, whatever. Um, but yeah, that's, that's, that is really important in, 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 in my work, in my soul, in my heart is to get this information out to as many people as I possibly can while I still can get it out. Perfect. Um, yeah. 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 Hit me up with that because, uh, yeah, I really want to learn how to do it. I, I think it's it's just probably the best thing and most regenerative thing that we can all be doing. And and uh, yeah, thanks, Leighton, for your yeah. work. Yeah, every, anybody can do this. This is I, I don't care if you're in a wheelchair, you can do this, right? It's, and, it's and, you, and you've got the um, the lab tests to to kind of show what what your expected results are. Oh, right? you you want a lab <laughs> test? All right, so. Right now, I'm up at Peach Hill Soils. I've been working on a formulation for scale biocomplete uh, compost. And um, I figured out the formula that I want to use. And the reason I'm using these ingredients is because uh, I'll tell you what the ingredients are. I'm using cocoa core that's left over from a vertical grow in uh, Los Angeles. I'm using spent mushroom substrate from a uh, mushroom farmer in LA. I'm using GOM, which is ground up organic matter. So we do not know what this, the C to N relationship is on the stuff. It's just, you'd have to see the piece of equipment. They're loading it and it's just, doesn't matter what they're loading in. It just grinds it up and, and blends it together. So every handful that comes off that's gonna be different with a C to N ratio. So that's very, very difficult to work. Um, and the last component is what's called kiln dried lumber that's been ground up. And what they do is they sift it off because they want the big pieces and they use dyes uh, to dye mulches. So they have green mulch, red mulch, brown mulch and black mulch. So what's coming off of that process is, again, these hard are kiln dried fines. So the fines, the core and the. Uh, um, now I've got a brain cramp. Mushrooms? Um, oh, mushroom substrate. All of those have a tremendous amount of water storage capacity. Um, the kiln dried fines and the GOM provide the structure because you don't want this to collapse. If, this, if the soil structure, if the compost structure collapses, it's going to go anaerobic, right? So with all that moisture holding capacity, you have to provide the structure necessary to maintain an aerobic condition. Um, and then the, so the kiln dried and the gum hold the structure, the other, the spent mushroom substrate, um, is, is super fine powdery. So it's a, it's a fine that you have to be careful that it doesn't migrate through, uh, and the, and the core, um, basically what they do is they run, you know, these dump truck dumpster loads through a screen and anything bigger than three eighths, they call that overbird and they throw that off. I'm using that too because that provides more structure because it's little nuggets. It's not like super fine. They want the super fine stuff for their soils. So those four ingredients, uh, one inoculation of my product, and I'm going to take a picture and send this to Ken right now to show you the numbers because I, I think this is probably the best work I've ever done. Um, and I've got probably 60 yards finished. Um, and then I've got another about a hundred yards in process. It'll be ready in about probably another month. So I'm turning this stuff. I'm, I'm turning components into biocomplete in 30 to 60 days. So that's, that's fucking kicking ass. <laughs> the one that I'm going to teach you about Lindsay is yeah, I would say it's six months because it's a little okay. bit more, it's a little bit more of a slow digest where I'm trying to be able to not only utilize these waste streams, but, but produce it uh, fast enough that it be cost effective. Mm -hmm. And that's why I asked about the price. I think the going price down here is about 750 a yard, um, which is, I mean, for what you're getting, it, it's amazing. But farmers can't afford that, right? And, and, you know, a cannabis grow, well, they used to be able to afford that. It's <laughs> here in California, it's questionable whether they can do that anymore either. 
bottom line is to not only utilize waste streams, prevent them from being just burned up, um, provide a product that, that is going to spin people's head when they use it and provide a product that's cost effective. So uh, that's, that's been my challenge for the last uh, five or six months. I, I, I did it. <laughs> it only took me five or six months. I'm pretty proud of that. <laughs> Great. Yes. No peat moss. So, so the more biologically complete compost in this world, the better, I think. So, but, okay, th Lindsay, that's that's your that's your start of your compost tea rest or your compost extract. Is there anything else that goes in your compost extract? And and um, would you mind sharing uh, how often you you apply this in in a uh, veg and flower cycle? Yeah, I mean that that depends. Uh, it depends on what I, you know. I try to stick to mostly the bi biologically complete compost. Um, if I am looking under the microscope and I see oh, like my bacterial population's a little low, and I want to ramp that up, I might use a really small amount of molasses or like coconut sugar or something to stimulate that. But I really am very conservative with that. Uh, because the last thing I want to do is create this sort of boom bust cycle, uh, kind of like Leighton was talking about uh, in his brewing process and the water columns. Like if you overfeed your compost extract, uh, you can create a, a bloom in biology that will then consume all of the oxygen in your soil. And you might see a short term benefit to your plants. You might get this big nutrient release that happens, but then it'll crash the whole system. And uh, again, we're coming back to that, like maintaining equilibrium uh, goal. So, so I want to avoid overstimulating anything. So, but if I if I am looking at, under the microscope and I see, oh, like biological activity is a little low, could maybe use a little food stimulating. Um, you know, a little bit of kelp in moderation. Again, you got to be careful of your source. So make sure it's not uh, full of heavy metals, not too high in sodium. But again, small quantities, you know, kind of like half a mil or a mil a liter, um, maybe a little bit of molasses here and there. But I really I really try to to not go too heavy on the food sources, again, to try and eliminate those variables of just causing this sort of boom bust cycle to happen. I'd rather sort of ramp things up slowly and try to maintain that than, uh, you know, put put the gas on full speed and then have a crash. Uh, you know, weekly weekly is a good sort of rule to follow. Wow. It also depends, you know, am I having any issues? Am I, am I doing things that might harm that biology? Well, then I might have to do it a little bit more frequently. Um, you know, what, what am I feeding? Am I, did I just do a big potassium sulfate application? Well, that probably didn't go so well for the biology. So I'll, I'll try to inoculate, uh, you know, immediately after that. You know, maybe you've got a little PM showing up or something. You need to do a knockback spray. Okay, do that. Um, but then, wait, wait, uh, sorry, when you say that, you mean uh, soil drench still, right? Uh, so when I was talking about the potassium sulfate, yeah, yeah. So if no, I did that, uh, you know, when when you're trying to knock back the uh, the PM, say you did a foliar spray yeah. of something like sulfur, or maybe you use citric acid or something. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that's very antimicrobial, and that's sort of the point of a knockback spray. But uh, so just make sure if I'm going to do that, then I'll try to re-inoculate right away after that. So I'm, I'm again building up my population. As as and sorry, and once again, as a foliar. Uh, no, as as no. a as a drench, uh, I yeah. will I will foliar. Um, you know, if you have uh, a bacillus uh, subtilis product or or you know any sort mm -hmm. of. Um, bacterial product that you can foliar, I, I would also recommend doing that after you do something that is very antimicrobial, just to sort of reset that that phyloscape in a, in a way that is uh, conducive to the biology as opposed mm -hmm. to just killing it. The last thing you want to do is sort of sterilize your system and then leave it open for pathogens to recolonize. So, Okay. Well, I missed a little bit about the foods, but if you're in an extract, I mean, then you, you don't really have those issues of, of worrying about. It. So I love I love that approach. Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. I, I do throw a little uh, humic acid in, in my extract as well. Just to. Yeah, just you can you can add little things. I would just like really caution people from overdoing it. Like you don't want to be adding like. 10 mils a liter of something like I find like if you're ever like unsure of the quantities of something go go for like aim for like 
one milliliter and you're, you're probably going to be okay. Um, you less know, is not, more. <laughs> less, less is more. Yeah. And, you know, and then ideally you can kind of, you know, take a soil sample and, and uh, make a slide up and kind of see, you, you should have a pretty, pretty immediate impact. I mean, you know, bacteria replicate every 20 minutes or whatever, like you can, you can see the effects uh, and you just, you just don't want to overdo it because the last thing you want is everything uh, to, to bloom and then consume all the oxygen in your soil. We don't want that. So you use a microscope then? I do. Yes, I do. Um, I am newer in my journey uh, with the microscope. I've really been enjoying learning about it. It's a, it's a whole new world that's opened up. Uh, yeah, I feel like, you know, I'm, I'm pretty, pretty comfortable with the, with the chemistry aspect at this point, but, but still very much learning uh, about the, uh, the biology side and quantifying that and really knowing what I'm looking at. Uh, I'd say I have a functional grasp right now, but uh, there are, you know, there's just so much to learn around that, that I just, you know, need to need to get the reps in. And I, but every time I, I look at a slide under the microscope, I'm, I'm fascinated. It's, it's so easy, like to just have like two hours go by and then you're like, oh my God, happened? like, how has that even happened? But yeah, it's really cool. I, I just got a really cool, uh, uh, like phone adapter for my microscope so I can take, take videos and pictures and stuff. And that's, yeah, that's a, that's a game changer also using uh, your your phone's camera to be able to zoom in on things even at, at the 400x magnification is, yeah. is helpful who, who did you study under to start identifying the different organisms um i took sarah scamnis's course crescent soil uh okay. so, yeah those guys are, are are awesome they they know a lot about living soil systems and uh, Sarah's a badass man. She's really good at what she does. And uh, so I've, I've learned a lot from her. I continue to learn a lot from her uh, and, and Scott as well. Uh, so they've been great resources for me. Fantastic. Okay. Did you want uh, me to bring that sheet up there, Layton, or you want to say yeah, that? Later? Yeah, let's, let's just tear through that really quick because there's some really interesting stuff that I want to talk f about further. Um, so if you see the top, you have labor a uh, layered b blended b blended b uh, no but yeah blended b 120 and then old pile so the old pile 60 days old um that one has an incredible fragrance it's that forest floor that you that we all love right um just incredibly amazing um perfume but if you look at um blended b um start with the bacteria the bacterial mass is, is off the charts at, at 5055.4 um, compared to the other ones right now slide down a little bit and look at the fungal biomass at 687 so again it's 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 way higher than the other ones um keep going down and you look to my f to b ratio and it's horrible it's 0.12 and the reason why is because we haven't finished the nutrient cycling or the um, the predation cycle. In other words, if you look down, look down at flagellates and amoeba, right? In the millions, that's off the chart. I think I think you only need uh, 10,000 10, or better to be, if you look at the first column, minimum values for biocomplete compost, 10,000. We're at a fucking million point three, all right? So this is like off the chart as far as like comparing to, um, you know, a biocomplete compost, and then look down at nematoding, nematode feeding bacteria and fungal feeding, right? Again, look at those numbers. They're insane. 690 bacterial feeders, 115 um, fungal feeders. Now, this is something that I've asked. This is Andy's work, all right? I've been working with Andy for a year. Um, I love her for many reasons, but one of them was she's always open-minded. She did the complete soil food web class. Um, but she wasn't afraid to go outside the box a little. So slide all the way to the bottom, Ken, if you would. And this is something I asked her to start doing. And that is, keep going, keep going. There you go. Estimated protozoan cysts, all right? In, in the one that we're looking at, we don't have any because they're all active. Estimated spores, 2.3 million. So when this stuff gets into the soil, those spores are going to go ballistic because those are all um, saprophytic fungi spores that we get from the spent mushroom substrate. Mm. 
So again, uh, one of the conversations that I had recently with her, and I'm going to reach out to Lane to talk about this further, is, is there or did she ever do any work when she came up with this F to B relationship? Did she ever look at F to P, so fungi to protozoa? And the reason I say this is because F to B ratios were uh, designed around undisturbed soil systems. So basically she said, oh, the redwoods are 10,000 to one uh, fungal to bacteria. Well, compost is the most disturbed system that you possibly can get. So of course you're going to have a higher bacterial relationship than you would in an undisturbed system. If you looked at that chart, the old pile, the bacteria had crashed down because the, the protozoa had consumed a lot of them, right? So there's this time lapse that, that needs to be addressed when you're looking at F to B ratios in disturbed soils, not in, not in undisturbed soils. And so I'm going to definitely reach out to her and, and see if that she actually did uh, any correlation to protozoa to fungi in an undisturbed system to better understand what that relationship could be or would be. Um, because I think that's another conversation that, again, as we evolve, we can't get locked into dogma. We have to keep learning. We have to keep finding new and better ways to understand what we're doing. When I put this stuff that I make, and, and I had, I, that, like I said, that was, that was got to be one of the best I've ever made in my life. Some of like the old pile stuff, still, still damn good, respectable. Um, that's the kind of stuff that I would have been using on, you know, half of half a million protozoa, you know, a couple hundred nematodes. Um, that's the stuff I've been using on a lot of the restorations over the last 14 or so years that I've been doing and, and had incredible plant response. So, I mean, I know that's great and it works good, but just look at the F to B relationship relationship on, uh, yeah, it's, it's 0.14. And again, that one's like my protozoa are down, my bacteria is down, but what if my protozoa from the first one was there instead, you know, these, these relationships need to um, have more data points so that we better understand what it is that we actually created. And, and you know, you can always, you can always rely on, on plant reaction, but plant reaction should be able to be correlated back to, you know, what we've actually done. Yes, exactly right, Billy. Um, did you guys have any questions on this before we move on? And, and just just a quick little blended bee. Um, at what stage is that at? Uh, that's that was at um, about two weeks in. Two weeks in. Okay. And I just sent that off to be retested. It's about it's a little over a month right now, and I'll have I'll have test data back on all four of these groups, um, which would have been about two to two and a half weeks post this test. So we'll be able to see the trending on the numbers because I expect in the blended bee that that bacterial numbers will go down um, and the flagellates may have gone up a little or they may be around the same, but we'll see. You know, that's just kind of a prediction. I think but maybe the you should thing, answer Billy's question now before we move on. It's all about the biology. Why did, why the, why did, did the amoeba not crash? crash? Well, why would they crash, Billy? They shouldn't. They should be present. They oh, we should have both, both types of protozoan if if we're going to be diverse, and and this again is we're we're supposed to be, you know, biocomplete. So you want to have amoeba as well as uh, the flagellates. So the difference between layered B and blended B, they're the same four inputs, but layered B is obviously like lasagna, so it's layered. Where blended is, I blended it up and then then built the pile and you know something else i should be fair too is these are not a typical pyramid pile i made a magic bar i made a brownie it's somewhere between 30 and 36 inches tall and like a sheet cake it's it's over you know uh 40 feet wide 40 feet long by about 18 to 20 feet wide so again i'm i'm, I'm using thermodynamics to prevent what we would call thermophilic phases, if that makes sense. Okay, so you're not, this is not a thermal composting mode of action. 
No, no. This I I don't thermal uh, thermophilically compost because I don't use any high end or manures. So these are all just plant based. And the gum, which is the only one that I would consider potentially pathogenic, um, does go through pathogen uh, type, uh, reduction. So that would be 160 degrees five times over the course of a month. And then once it goes through pathogen reduction, then I have the guys bring it up to me. Okay. Good question, though. Gab, did you have anything you wanted to add or, or question? Uh, no, no, that's 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 great. No, I'm... Yeah, there'll be more to come on this as the as the show moves on. There'll be you know I'll, I'll continue with updates, but no, I would not call this a precaution at all. It's 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 very much a cold composting. But let's get back to Lindsay. Like, <laughs> um, so yeah, so I think that. You know, your approach to extracts is, is a really important pe piece for people to understand is that, you know, when you're when you're extracting, um, you're, you're, you don't have to deal with a lot of other nightmares of biofilm and, and crash and all these other things. Um, so how do you extract, Lindsay? Yeah, I just I use a, a mesh bag and I uh I put my, my inoculum in there and I like to massage it for a good three to five minutes. Uh, make sure that it's really, uh, I'm really sort of loosening up the biology in there. Uh, another thing is I try to make sure that my water is not ice cold, which is sometimes hard to do in the winter. There's like, you know, there's a lot of little pieces of, of trying to sort of promote and sustain biological populations. And some of them are as easy as like, well, your water is, you know, 40 degrees, like they're probably not going to be too active in there. Um, so I try to have it around 65 would be ideal. Uh, and yeah, I, I'd love to get like a, a conical bottom res. Uh, I do have a, a flat bottom res right now. And there is some, it's usually just, just me working. If there was, a, if I had staff there on days that I do, I would get them to gently stir it. I do have sort of a, a, a bubbling component and aeration component that goes in there to just try and keep uh, keep the, the heavier things like the nematodes from falling to the bottom. But um, my understanding of the physics of it is like a flat bottom res is not, not the best thing to use. A conical would be better because uh, you end up just, uh, you know, the biology sort of ends up uh, just kind of bouncing off your air bubbles and, and floating to the bottom regardless, but uh, that's the best I have to work with uh, when it's just me. And uh, and I try to also really mix up my watering. I don't start with the same bed every time. I like to start with different beds and uh, make sure my watering pattern is is uh, being mixed up constantly. I do that constantly, not just for, for the biology, but uh, uh, when I do a compost extract, I try to make sure I, I don't just start in the same place all of the time. I've, I've recently uh, changed my nematode application. I will, I will do a separate nematode application, uh, separate from the compost extract. I find even in really good biologically complete compost, the, the nematode numbers are often quite low or lower than I'd, I'd like them to be. So I do apply those separately. Uh, uh, and I use uh, Scott and Sarah's method, which at first I was like, oh, my God, that's ridiculous. I'm never doing that. And, and uh, it still wouldn't be necessarily that great at large scale. But I use like a, a 500 mil wash bottle uh, and I just go around after I've applied my compost extract and I'll just use two of those per bed. Uh, and I just kind of squirt them on the top of the surface once I know that I've watered and there's enough moisture in there uh, that they're they're not just going to desiccate when they hit the soil. It's not great to apply nematodes when when your soil is really dry. Uh, so I just do it that way so I know that my applications are are really super even. And it actually doesn't take as long as I thought at first. I was like, that's way too tedious. How how would anyone ever do that? But I'm like, oh, that's actually it doesn't take that long. And you know that you get a really good distribution of nematodes. So that's what I do. Do you, do, you, do you use a nematode bucket to apply them? I'll, I'll like mix them up in, in, uh, in a small bucket, maybe a couple gallons of water, and just make sure that I'm constantly stirring that when I'm filling up my, my little wash bottles so that they're always suspended uh, so that I know that they're in there as, as evenly as possible. 
And are you pumping the water from your extract or are you pouring it in a watering can? I'm, I'm pumping it. Yeah. I'm pumping from uh, I usually use a 50 gallon res and just a, a Mondi pump, just a, a sump pump. Uh, I think it's the least sort of detrimental pumping method to your biology. If you, uh, it's pretty like, it's pretty low key. I'm sure there's a little bit of dieback in that process, but, but minimal. Yeah. Um, so I spent a shit ton of time playing with pumps. And I highly recommend you get a diaphragm pump. You will have zero loss. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, I played with trash pumps. I played with pumps that said they were diaphragm. And, you know, I would do before. So after I finished my extract, I do a slide and then I run it through the pump and then do another slide. And what I do, and I don't understand why more people don't do this, is on the slide, you put two drops, one from before, one from after, cover slip them. And then you can go back and forth. That's and a good not thing. Up a new slide. So mm -hmm. that's a, you know, another great way when you're doing side by side uh, slides. Instead of two slides, do both slides on one on one uh, slip. Mm -hmm. And and that way you'll really see what's going on with that. Um, so we did a number of projects over the years with people who were like, "Oh yeah, no, I got the right pump. I got the right pump." No, mm -hmm. the, that pump is so critical. You, like I tell people, <clears throat> "Fuck the pump." If you can't get a real diaphragm pump, water and can only, because mm -hmm. you, you're not going to have any loss whatsoever. Um, mm -hmm. So back to the extracting process, how long do you run your extract for? Uh, like how long do I have it in the res before I apply it? Uh, not very long. I mean, I, like I said, I like to massage it for about five minutes. Uh, I apply it pretty immediately. Uh, you know, I might give it a few minutes or so, but I, I'm really not, uh, I'm not sort of trying to brew it or anything. I'm just trying to get it in there. So uh, not very long. So like a five minute extract. Yeah. I mean, yeah, maybe five or 10 minutes. Um, uh, wait till you see this technique that's on that video that you're going to get. <laughs> that's going to pop your mind. Uh, basically it's a way to what I call soft collide. So we're not we're like if I was we were standing above ground and I or on the ground and I punch you, it hurt. Right. But if we go underwater and I punch you, you're going to feel it, but it's not going to hurt. Right. So soft colliding is using the organic matter to brush against itself to pull all the humix fulvics as well as all the biology off of it. And by doing this, you literally are making your own humic acid. So you don't need any humic acid when you extract this well. Um, you know, people are always, oh, well, I don't want to put your product in, in, into my, you know, chlorinated water. I'm like, don't worry about it. There's so much humic acid in there that as soon as that stuff hits the water, all of that is gone. It's tied up, bound up, and you don't have to worry about it. And this technique will help you to make what I call chocolate water. So it's so thick that when you put your hand in there and you lift it up, you can't see your palm of your hand. It's, it's chocolate water. And by having chocolate water, each one of those tiny suspended particulate is organic matter, is like a condominium so that it can be colonized by the bacteria, the protozoa, the fungi. And when you apply it, you've given that biology food, water, and cover. So you're not just throwing in biology into a hostile environment. You're throwing it in, you're throwing it in with everything it needs to colonize. So again, these are techniques that I've developed over many, many years and have figured out how to scale it up, but also scale it back down for individuals. So in that video, I, I use a cordless uh, drill on low and I use a paint mixer and I throw the compost right in a bucket of water and I just run it for, you know, five minutes or so. <clears throat> you make chocolate water and this is going to be a game changer for you. Instead of wasting time massaging a bag, <laughs> you're going to get 100% uh, biological collection in a very short period of time. And, and how are you applying that, Leighton? Like, I find one, one sort of uh, challenge around applying extracts sometimes is having the right watering wand and having the right... Uh, the right size pores on your on your watering wand. It's it's really annoying when it's constantly clogging. Um, well, yeah. what I do is I take the water wand off, yeah. and I put on one of those simple little ball valves with the twist on it. 
Yeah, yeah. I find I find I don't get really great distribution over the the surface of the soil that way. Um, I I use my regular sort of dram watering wand, but I have to constantly sort of un, unplug it. I'm constantly taking it off and just like banging out some of the, <laughs> the, bigger, the bigger particles. It's it's annoying, but I'm not sure. Right, get, it, get a better drill. method. Yeah, get a drill bit and open those holes up. Yeah, yeah, that's an idea for sure. Uh, but yeah, with this, my equipment, I have, um, you know, again, very blessed to be, you know, someone who's very, very mechanically inclined and, and also very driven to find out the best ways. So I have a dual diaphragm pump that's run, uh, you can get them, you can get them that are electric now. When I bought mine, you couldn't, it had to be air powered. Um, so that is a, that is a technique. The dual diaphragm is a little better because basically it's like a heart lung machine. So first it gives you a heartbeat, then it gives you oxygen, then it gives you a heartbeat, then it gives you oxygen. So that's how it's moving the liquid through. It's one diaphragm closes while the other one opens and then reverses the process back and forth. And you get zero, zero loss of any type of biology. That way. So that's another thing that you might want to look into. Yeah, I'll uh, research those. Okay, now I'm going to jump right back in and find out. We, we talk a lot about the soil and the biology. And we also do want to talk a little bit about your, your, your cultivation of your plants. Um, you know, everything from have you tried using cover crops uh, to your planting density to your pruning? What are the things are you seeing in your beds because of the way you cultivate? Yeah, uh, you know, for the last year or so, I've been consistently moving to a lower planting density. I've really experimented a lot with with uh, very high densities to uh, what I'm doing now, which uh, are I would have to say maybe like eight or nine nine plants a light, maybe. Um, have to kind of double check that, but. Uh, it, it, you know, the caveat being that it's very cultivar specific, the structure of your plant is going to dictate that a lot, uh, whether you, you know, you micro pinch uh, your clones to facilitate more of a branchy structure, or if you don't do that, uh, you know, there's no one way to do it. I have found, uh, you know, I'm growing some really kind of <laughs> like Gucci OG strains, like real, like kind of like vigorous sort of longer internodal spacing uh just just like they will grow into the lights if you're not careful um but i found spacing those out a little bit more uh there's less competition for light in the canopy and and that seems to to work well i i, I it also allows me more veg space planting lower numbers uh, so i can spread my veg plants out a little more too which just seems to facilitate much better growth uh, I have definitely experimented with planting very high density and trying to kind of get your numbers that way and get your yields that way. Uh, I'm, I've been moving away from that consistently. And I have, uh, you know, things like just the stock diameter of those spindly plants that I'm trying to increase. So I've seen good, good results with that so far. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the prune, uh, it, you know, it, I've, I don't like to do a really big prune all at once. I don't like to remove all the solar panels uh, in one fell swoop. I prefer to to space out my prune sort of uh, into the first few weeks of flower, even up to sort of week four or something where I'm just doing a light prune to kind of make sure that I'm getting all that snarby stuff uh, out and that's not getting light. But again, maintaining thermodynamic equilibrium, I do not like to uh, suddenly remove all of all of the solar panels from my plant all at once. I think it's too stressful, uh, uh, especially under LEDs where the, that light intensity is, is a lot, you know, like they're getting reduction power from that light. Uh, they need surfaces to absorb that. Uh, and if you remove all of that at once, uh, you can you can kind of disrupt that balance. So yeah, which again, like, but I'm not ultra conservatively, you know, like if you, if you don't prune those plants pretty hard, you're just going to also end up with a lot of small stuff and I'm not interested in that. So, it, you know, within reason, but I do like to space out the prune a bit and, and kind of just tackle it over the course of, of uh, a number of weeks as opposed to just doing it all at once. And then you can kind of see how the canopy's filling in and 
uh, I do pretty intensive canopy management. I, I grow in a legacy project with, with very low ceilings. And so I do not have the ceiling height to just let those, those plants really branch out and go nuts. So uh, I do a lot of uh, low stress training. We really like to use, I, I really like a, a hard, a hard grate for the first level of support as opposed to just a soft net because I can, I can bend plants over, I can weave them underneath, I can tie, I can tie them out uh, so I can let those secondary branches grow up. So it's, it's not uh, very practical for a large scale. It wouldn't be a very scalable method, but for, for small craft scale, the, the, the scale that I'm growing at and the constraints of, of my rooms, I really have to do a lot of intensive can canopy management. I, I can be very fastidious about that. Uh, it's very much about being detail oriented and, and uh, obsessive, <laughs> probably a bit obsessive around, around how that canopy is managed, uh, especially when you're just growing those vigorous gangly ass strains that uh, are are awesome, but they're also, they can be, you know, it takes several rounds to really dial in how to manage that canopy. I've found uh, when you're, when you're uh, running some new cultivars, it's a bit of, it's a bit of guesswork at first and it can take a little while to dial it in. So uh, yeah, that's a, that's a constant process. Um, yeah. What else? Would you, would you call it lollipopping? Or? I, yeah, I, I wouldn't necessarily call it that. Again, it depends on the cultivar, but in, and I do like to prune fairly high up, up a branch, depending on, uh, again, the density of planting, the structure of that plant. Uh, I have found for, for some of the strains that I'm growing recently, it's almost been a little bit counterintuitive where like you want to prune off all of that sort of like spindly stuff, but but uh, I found actually leaving some of it and pruning up of those branches has led to a more full canopy. Um, it, 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 you have to let the structure of the plant dictate how you prune it. Uh, they're, they're very different and it, it takes a lot. You have to run the cultivar a couple of times to really see uh, what it's going to do, I feel like. Uh, there's a lot of different techniques there, but we, yeah, I do a lot of uh, managing of the canopy mostly because my ceiling height is so low. So it is a pretty labor intensive part of the cultivation process for me. Uh, but I also really enjoy it and it lets me spend a lot of time with the plants and really sort of assess how they're growing and, and how that canopy is filling in and, you know, just get to hang out with the girls. That's what I'm I, talking about. The, the other question I wanted to, um, find out is just about your re-amendment process. Um, maybe if you could speak a little bit about soil pH and, yeah. and perhaps um, if you've ever tried cover crops. Yeah, uh, I, I think I'll address the cover crops first. Um, as, you're, as you're building the complexity of a living soil system, I think uh, cover crops are great. Uh, we, had, we did at first run a living cover crop um, we stopped doing that mostly for uh, expenses and, and labor costs. Uh, and then we, we mostly just run a straw mulch layer. I would uh, love to run dichondra as a, as a combination, like living cover crop and, and also a brown mulch layer. I think the combination is great. Um, I'd like to experiment with uh, using Kingstrophaeria uh, as a to inoculate that straw. I think uh, I've, I've heard that it can really create a nice sort of buffer layer between of oxygen between the soil surface and your mulch layer. I, I haven't done it yet, but I, I have some spores that have been sitting in my fridge for a while that I'd like to experiment. Uh, I think the you know that that mulch layer that that uh, or cover cropping if you're using it that that layer immediately above the soil surface is crucial to manage and it's uh, it's something that's very very difficult you can easily overdo it and cause your soil to go anaerobic you can you know you can underdo it and then you have too much evaporation coming off and your your biology can't sustain itself in those those top few inches of the soil uh, it's something that that I've constantly tried to dial in uh, as well. I've ex kind of experimented. I did get a uh, a monocot aphid from from the straw at one point, which was really interesting, and it, it scared us a little bit 
uh, it wasn't really directly harmful to the cannabis, but it was, you know, certainly proliferating and it, and it came in in the straw. And so that sort of scared us away from using a mulch layer for a while. But you just absolutely cannot sustain biological populations or get adequate nutrient cycling without having a mulch layer uh, unless you're oversaturating your soil, which I don't recommend. Uh, so that's yeah, that's really crucial. I'd. I, I, did, I think the combination of dichondra as a living as a living uh, cover crop that doesn't grow too high uh, and, and the mulch layer of, of straw, a brown mulch layer is uh, sort of the, the standby. But to keep it to keep it simple and in a commercial setting, uh, we've mostly, mostly just been running uh, a straw layer. And sometimes I'll even like do a really light layer at the beginning and veg when they're not taking as much water. And then uh, as they sort of ramp up and get into flower and I can water more, that root system is established more. Uh, I can, uh, you know, adjust that mulch layer a little bit. Uh, again, moisture management, I, you know, it's no surprise that Sarah got really passionate talking about it because it is just one of the hardest things uh, to really, really execute well in living soil systems and an absolutely crucial thing to do as well. It all comes back to that. You could execute everything else perfectly, uh, but your watering is off, and you will you will not have good success. Uh, and and you know, you could... I, I wanted to jump to the dead mulch. Um, uh, do, do you pasteurize that 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 straw? I I don't. I you definitely could. Uh, that would be. Yeah, I, you know, I've done a bit of research around that, especially uh, as I was researching uh, potentially inoculating with the King Strafaria. Uh, yeah, it's, you know, it's another huge labor component. Uh, you can sterilize things. I'd want to re-inoculate that with some beneficials if I were to do that instead of just, again, sterilizing and then sort of having this clean slate for pathogens to come in. I think you can absolutely pasteurize uh your your mulch layer, but I would I would really recommend inoculating immediately with something that you want to be in there. I haven't experimented with that. I kind of, you know, in some ways, just kind of go the Masanobo route and I'm like, okay, put some straw down. Like, trust that like the living systems will will be in balance and support support the balance of the living system, and it will it will sort of work out there. I, I try not to get too much into a mindset of needing to kill things. Um, I'm more looking to support things that... I was thinking more in, in, in if uh, if we were trying to do this within Health Canada uh, and have a QA sort of sign off on it. And I would think that they might sign off on something like if it was pasteurized, um, that might might be a way of getting it in, in, uh, in beyond a bypass a, a QA that way. Yeah, yeah, there could there could definitely be some issues around that. And again, like anything, right? You want to make sure you're sourcing your whatever. If it's a mulch layer, your straw, you want to make sure it's organic. You want to make sure it hasn't been, you know, grown with a bunch of glyphosate. And like you, you know, you really have to be careful and do your due diligence around where you're sourcing that stuff. Um, and Lindsay, the someone wanted to know what you would re-inoculate that straw with if you were going to re-inoculate compost. Uh, extract. Yeah, right. exactly. yeah, yeah, yeah. Biologically complete compost. Uh, you know, the more diversity in there, the better of the good guys, obviously. Um, but yeah, you could just you could easily you could put it on, and I, I would apply a, a compost extract immediately. And do, and do you find that in a, typically? Uh, I'm not sure if you're doing eight, eight to nine week flowers, um, but do you find that a lot of it breaks down in eight to nine weeks? Yeah, it depends. You know, it depends on, on uh, how thick you've made that mulch layer. I do find that it breaks down. Uh, it's a good, you know, it's a good carbon source for fungi uh, because we're not doing strictly no-till. Like, you know, we're ripping out those root balls and that I'd, I'd like to move more towards like low-till. Uh, but, you know, even if you're mixing it in a bit, it's it provides a bit of aeration in there. And I don't, I don't mind if it's not all broken down just because it can kind of get mixed into that soil surface a little bit. Uh, if there's like a bunch left, I've probably, I've probably over applied it a little bit. Uh, but I try not to have that layer be too, too thick. Like I still, I can still see some of the soil surface through it. It's not just like pure, pure straw mulch layer. Uh, so yeah, I don't go too crazy there. So I had another uh, question. Um, well, actually, I've got a bunch, but 
we'll start with this. Have you ever thought of using potato as a cover crop? Potato? No, I have not experimented with that or 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 use that. I highly recommend it. Uh, both, you know, Josh and Kelly uh, and I have talked about for whatever reason this connection between the potato plant and the cannabis plant, and there's something really there. So please in try it, that. In an indoor setting, though. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, in an indoor setting. They've actually had can cannabis plants grow right around the potato. Like the root goes right around the whole potato and there's an inter interface of some kind. I don't know whether it likes the starch or I, I don't know, but there's something to potato and cannabis. Hmm. Uh, and do, have you ever mycorrhizae tested your, your beds? Have you ever tested your roots? I haven't. I'd like to. I'm not aware of a lab in Canada that does that. I would. I would love to. Uh, can, you guys, can you guys send out of Canada to U.S.? We, yeah. I am not sure. Like you know, I send my soil to Logan Labs in the U.S., but I send my leaf tissue to A and L Labs in Canada. I'm not sure. Like technically, around cannabis roots um probably just call them something else and it'd be okay yes yeah, so so micro roots m-y-c-o roots ken can you pull them up um i really wish you would send out after your next run just take a couple samples reach out to afrin have him you know guide you as how many root samples and, and you want the feeders the tips not the big thick ones mm -hmm. but i think it's really important that you do this test to understand if you do not have a high level of colonization, you, you should, you, you, you should apply something. Um, I know Tom is getting some bioratus from him at some point in the future. Um, oh, that, wait a minute though. You're in, you're in soilless medium. Are you in super soil? So you don't uh, have soil. It's not super soil. Oh. It, it's, there's no sand, silt or clay. So technically it's, it's soilless. Uh, All right. Then, then don't, don't worry about the mycorrhizae. And that was, that was going back to the potato too, because, there, there would have been an interaction, you know, biologically between those two as well. Not that, not that you can't try it. You know what? Heck with it. Send out a sample and, and let's just see what happens. All right. Um, if you did get colonization or not. Um, and then this one's for you, Av. So you were talking a little bit about, um, you know, this pruning back. And I've had so many conflicting opinions about, like, oh, yeah, pulling those solar panels is bad. The plant can't, you know, build its ADP and it can't function as well. And others say, oh, I pull them off as fast as I can because I just get dynamic bud growth. It, all the energy is going to the buds and not to, to growing out the fans or sustaining the fans. What do you feel about that? And uh, I was I was right with you uh, with that. I would I would say, well, that yeah, that makes a lot of sense in you know, to, to lollipop and, and, or to even to Schwab things. Right. Um, but it didn't make sense to me in, in a living soil where of course we are looking for that photosynth photosynthate to really drive microbial life. And, and yet now I find LSO growers who are doing a strong defoliation in the second week of flower to the point where it, it is almost like Schwabing. And, I, I was amazed and they're saying it fills right back up in the next two weeks. It's all, all back, back to where it's at. So, um, there it's, yeah. So I, I, I guess I, I can't, to me, I, my reasoning was, Hey, let's leave those solar panels because we need that for food for the, for the microbes. But obviously in, in our systems, we have adequate amount of food. And, and so the, the plants seem to be happy enough to, to, uh, to regenerate, um, a lot of the foliage in, in a short matter of time. Yeah, they really do. And it, and depending on, again, the cultivars that you're running, I, I do defoliate. I don't, I don't just leave everything because I want to open up uh, the light penetration of the canopy as well. I just, I really try to hit that sweet spot of not taking off more than I need to, but taking off enough so that I get adequate light penetration so that there's good air movement in the canopy. And, uh, and it's a fine line and, and some, you know, some thinner leaf cultivars don't, don't need very much at all. And some like some things that have massive fan leaves that are going to shade everything out. Yeah. I'll go harder on those. Yeah. And Lindsay, have you ever thought about using old wood chips instead of straw? Um, I, yeah, I, I have incorporated wood chips into my beds in the past. Uh, 
but not not as a mulch layer. No, I, my concern would be that there wouldn't be enough uh, sort of air penetration through that layer. I mean, I guess if you were if they were pretty small and you kind of didn't go too thick. Um, yeah, I, I haven't used wood chips as a mulch layer before. So um, what I've used in the past um, is, again, old wood chips. So one to two years sitting in nature. Nothing new. If you use new, you're going to have huge problems because they're going to actually deplete nitrogen. Mm -hmm. so if they're old and punky, so you can actually kind of squeeze them a little bit. They're perfect. They hold moisture, so they're slow-release top moisture holders. If they're big, clumpy, you're going to get a ton of mycelium with them. They're going to allow the air to penetrate, and they're going to last longer than the hay. And I don't think you're going to have any issues with, with uh, pests coming in on them. And, mm -hmm. and I've, I've done this and had mushroom blooms because of yeah. it. So yeah. try, try that on a bed. I, I think you'll probably have pretty good luck with that. Yeah, yeah, worth an experiment for sure. For sure. And I'm going to jump right back, and this is strictly to try to find out a good solution. Um, I, I do find a lot of our living soil uh, growers end up having their pH just start mm -hmm. skyrocketing, right? I was yeah. just wondering, you're re-amending. Mm -hmm. uh, how do, you, how do you maintain your pH in your in your soil beds and and when you're reamending? What's your what's your process around that? Yeah, yeah, I like to track my pH. Uh, you know, I like to trend it over time. Obviously, if you see something coming, either a dramatic increase or decrease, then uh, you've probably added something in a quantity that you shouldn't have. I find if you're adequately managing the Malik 3 test, the standard test, uh, and you have good ratios of nutrients, your pH should fall in line. Uh, yeah, I, you know. And you're, and you're hitting around 6'2", six, 6'4"? Six, six, yeah, I like 6'4", uh, you know, anywhere. I don't I don't worry if it's anywhere between 6 and, you know, 6'8", I'm, I'm pretty happy. A little bit of fluctuation is okay. Uh, if I'm seeing large fluctuations, it, it's probably the quantity of amendments, you know. And if I see it start to drop a little bit, because some soils have a tendency to acidify over time, depending on, again, this is largely dependent on what you're using as liquid feed sources and as amendments. Uh, I do like wollastonite to uh, to add some silica in there to add some calpia slow slow release form of calcium and uh, just to slowly kind of nudge that pH uh, up a little bit if I'm finding it's dropping too much. Uh, I don't use fish hydrolysate. I find uh, overdoing that and using, uh, you know, and you can really mess with your uh, exchangeable hydrogen, which is directly correlated to your pH. So I avoid things that are too, uh, can, can cause too much flux in the system. Uh, but I find if you're if you're hitting your your targets and if you're managing uh, the Malik three test specifically and you're not just focused on on the pace test, if you're just focused on the pace test, uh, you will find a lot of pH fluctuation and your system will uh, not be stable over the long term. I find if you're if you're managing the Malik three test adequately and you have you know good levels of of calcium in there uh then you you should be okay with your with your ph being in a stable range i i'm treating this as one big teaser for the grow up conference uh because uh i i have about another hundred questions but uh i think ken has politely said there's a lot of audience questions so i'll shut the fuck up and <laughs> I'll come out to, to hear lindsay in, at the grow up conference <laughs> Well, and that's great, Ab, because she's going to have a, a panel at the Grow Up, and, and everybody should be there to listen to what she's going to say. But yeah, we've got a, a few uh, from the audience that uh, we'd like to, to do. So, um, Lindsay, are you growing in pots, beds, or in the ground, or all three? Uh, I'm growing in beds. I'm growing in living soil beds. Um, you know, they're about four by 20, approximately, um, rolling beds. Yeah. Okay, and uh, Lucas wanted to know, I've heard from Nick from Rooted Leaf uh, suggested flushing with potassium product. Will any uh, cation, cation, I can't even say it, uh, cation flush out excesses? 
No, no, they will not. Uh, potassium is specifically used as a flushing agent and why Nick recommends it uh, is because potassium is an electrolyte and it does not get incorporated into cellular structures the way that say calcium does and magnesium is part of the chlorophyll molecule. Potassium is a great flush flushing agent because uh, it, it does not actually become a constituent of, uh, of the, the leaf tissue or the buds. Uh, so yeah, do not, do not try to flush your plants with magnesium. That will not go well. Uh, and I would say stick to potassium. Potassium is great, but do not, do not feed potassium sulfate uh, late into flower, uh, not because of the potassium, but because of the sulfur uh, and the sulfates uh, that will make your weed taste like garbage. Uh, you, Organics Alive makes a good product. So any, any carbon-based fertilizer, that's what Nick from Rooted Leaf, he, he specializes in carbon-based fertilizers. So uh, a potassium, like a late, a late bloom potassium heavy carbon-based fertilizer would be a good thing. You can feed that right up to harvest, but no, do not just try to flush, you know, your 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 system with any cation, uh, potassium specifically, but the right flavor of potassium. Ah, Leighton, you got anything to add to that? I've always flushed with calcium, oh, and the reason yeah. why is calcium is double bonded, so it knocks off that salt very quickly, um, and it will knock potassium off. So you have to be careful to monitor your saturated paste to make sure you didn't overdo it. More yeah, often we I should specify here. I, I so I interpreted the question as like like flushing your your plants before harvest. If if I were to flush my soil, I would absolutely use gypsum. Uh, if I were looking to flush any excesses out of my plant right before harvest, I would I would use potassium and I would feed calcium up to uh, you know the week before flower. I, I like to feed cal calcium late into flower. I think that's a great thing to do. And again just the right forms of calcium. You do not want to be feeding, you know, drenching a bunch of gypsum or, you know, using sulfate forms of any kind. I don't like to use any sulfate form really beyond sort of week four. Uh, I just find sulfate buildup in your, in your flower will not make it burn well and, and not make it taste good. Okay. Leighton, have anything to add to that? No, I she's spot on. And I'm glad we clarified that because there is a big difference between flushing for, chemistry and plants and flushing for uh, cation exchange uh, capacity sites. Most definitely. Yeah. Av is way too relaxed with it. With, he's got, he's still drinking, you know, not, <laughs> not iced tea. Fortunately, I finished my whiskey. Um, <laughs> no, I, I was, there's a few things that Lindsay said that just, I, I'm, I'm so intrigued by. I, I hadn't heard about the association with, with sulfates and, and uh, it affecting the burn quality and the taste. Um, I, I think that's, that's something I'd like to learn more about. And then, and then, um, your comments about fish hydrolysate, I thought that was kind of interesting. Did you, if, if we've got time, I'd love, I'd love to hear more about your, your, uh, your thoughts around, uh, why you don't recommend fish hydrolysate. You know what? Let me, let me interject. The reason why is most hydrolysates have to be pH stabilized. Otherwise they rot and stink like hell. So that pH, like I was going to jump in on that too, but I left it alone. Um, whenever anyone's using a fish hydrolysate, they should pH stabilize it before they use it. So don't try to do it in the soil. Just take your hydrolysate, add your up uh, to get it to, you know, wherever you, you like 6'4". I'm, I'm a personally 6'8", 8, 8, 7, 8 guy, but, you know, you can definitely stabilize it before you use it. And then you do not have that issue. But, but it's going if to, you, if you use too much, it's going to stink like hell. So, yeah, no, I and I typically will recommend using humic acid with it. Um, and now I'm intrigued why you push uh, such a high pH because I, I always find that uh, um, I, I do find trace mineral deficiencies like zinc, iron, manganese, and, and phosphorus uh, difficult at high pH. But, but then again, I'm using a low tensile, low tension soil. So, so, so that's really good stuff, um, Av, but. Again, you know, I, I believe in it's all about the biology. So I believe the biology will adjust pH in the rhizosphere to harvest exactly what they want when they want it. So I kind of like let go and let God or what, trust the universe, whatever you want to call it. 
but I have no issues with going a little bit higher because you know that soil is going to acidify anyway. So you're going to, you're, you're just buffering your, your, your lack of, uh, you know, drop in pH as, as, and as Lindsay said, that is an issue in these living soils. Yeah. Yeah. If you have a heavy peat component, it, it depends what, what the composition of your soil is. They, they do tend to acidify unless you're going crazy heavy on your calcium and, and certain calcium amendments, uh, will will up the ph and I, I like to have those in my arsenal I, I like to be able to just you know add a little bit of a willastonite to to make sure i'm i'm uh, not dropping too much i, I find with fish hydro hydrolysate which i have which i have used uh i've moved away from that it can be again yeah depending on what your source is you you know you can you can be bringing in things that you don't want to bring in uh, it's most, most fish hydrolysate is stabilized with phosphoric acid, uh, which can tank your pH. It can drop it really fast. Uh, you can, you can really overdo it. And then your exchangeable hydrogen on your Logan test, uh, skyrockets can lead to, uh, real susceptibility to bug problems and the higher your exchangeable hydrogen is the less room you have for calcium, the less room you have for potassium and magnesium, your other cations. So, uh, you know, that's probably a reason why Leighton likes to run his pH a little higher too, is you, you open up uh, space in your base saturation for, for nutrients uh, like calcium. Yeah. I find for me, I really target around six, four. I don't get too, uh, too out of sorts if, if I see a little bit of fluctuation there, but I find when you are, when you are focused on the Malik three test uh, and not just managing the pace test, uh, you, your pH will fall into line. Uh, and, and, and also if you're using a diversity of calcium sources and you know, you're not just, yeah. it's not just all lime or whatever. Okay. I think we'll go to the next question. Um, do you use uh, JMS uh, um, at all? Like, uh, are you into Korean natural farming at all? Uh, like I said, I've experimented with some uh, FPJs. Uh, I, I don't really incorporate uh, Korean natural farming techniques into my current cultivation practices. Um, what my fungi content is, uh, you know, I will say that it is a mission constantly for me to get my beneficial fungi numbers up, and it's very hard to do. Uh, you know, it's really easy to have high bacterial counts uh, you know, you can get protozoa in there. You can apply nematodes. Uh, beneficial fungi is, it, it takes a long time. And unless you are really, uh, you know, doing no-till and you're using bottomless pot tech and, uh, you know, cover crops and you're doing really pulling out all the stops, uh, it's really easy to decimate beneficial fungi populations. Even, you know, you have a bit of a dryback or something happens, uh, you know, you can, you can, I do use, uh, I use mycospores. I do, I do uh, inoculate my clones, my rooted clones with spores. Uh, again, there's a lot, you know, I don't even, I'm not totally confident that my spores are even viable. A lot of them on the market are not. Uh, I, would, I would love to sort of get, get into testing some of those just to see the viability. Um, yeah, yeah, getting, getting beneficial fungi numbers up and, and maintaining them is is a real challenge, especially if you're if you're not doing strictly no till and using bottomless pot tech. If you are removing those root balls, you know, we we are transplanting every every eight weeks into those beds. And it's it's a lot of disturbance, uh, even when you try to minimize it. Old wood chips, one to yeah. two year old wood chips. Yeah. That'll rock your fungi, your saprophytes, not your microbes. Yeah. I know that's what I used uh, for three years was old wood chips from a, a pile that I'd had for two years. And, and it was just beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, now, the next statement was uh, Billy was talking about using an FPJ uh, created from uh, three week cannabis plants. Um, he says it's it's really good. So I don't know if you've ever tried uh, tried that, but it's something that you might want to try in the future. Yeah, yeah, I've used, uh, I've made FPJs from cannabis plants. Uh, I've used uh, FPJs from nettle and from knotweed. I got, a, got an invasive knotweed patch out back. Uh, yeah, yeah, they're, they're good. I'm not, I, I'm definitely not like, uh, you know, I think there's a lot of great, uh, great things about Korean natural farming. I, again, personally, I, I like to really minimize sort of the, the variability that can happen with those things. Uh, 
and I think you just have to be really careful about what your what your inputs are too. Like if you're using any kind of like JADAM or, or KNF thing that like involves uh, things that have been grown with a lot of glyphosate, then you're 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 really shooting yourself in the foot. And I would love to see more uh, natural farming, Korean national natural farming techniques and and products being tested. Uh, I'd love to see some data on on what they're actually coming back in as, as for nutritional quantities for microbial counts. Uh, I'd love, I, I think they, they could be amazing. Again, for me, it's just, uh, there's a lot of variables that, uh, you know, are, are labor intensive to, to quantify. And I, I just try to minimize those, but, but yeah, I'm not, I'm not at all sort of against making, making your own inputs and, and utilizing plants around you. There's a, there's a lot of great things that can come out of that if Amen. done correctly. Yeah. Layton, did you have anything to add Av? No, I, I think she's spot on again. It's know your source, right? Yeah. Um, and people are trying to make money and maybe are not as ethical as you or me. And therefore you get yourself in trouble real quick. So yeah. I agree with Lindsay hundred percent. So Lily had a question when you were talking about what you were doing before late. And if you were talking about the muncher for, for the products, et cetera, you're using. No, that's, that's next level. So the muncher's value is, is really targeted toward turning dirt into soil. Um, they're working with aerobes as well as anaerobes, as well as facultative anaerobes. So they've really covered the spectrum and, and we'll get into that May 1st for sure. Lil. Yeah. Okay, and uh, diggity here. Uh, if I was going to buy some BioComplete compost to put in with my compost to help kickstart it a bit, what some com um, companies to go with? Now, I told him for the U.S., uh, Wormies is really good. Do you guys know somebody in Canada that uh, is, is very good? Ab, you had two people, or, or Lindsay, you had two people. Yeah, the ones I know of are uh, uh, Vivian from uh, Docter, D-O-C-T-E-R-R-E. -E. Uh, that's in Quebec and uh, root shoot soils in Vancouver there. Abby, you said you had a source in Manitoba? Yeah, uh, yeah o Overton. Um, they, they put out the EcoTea product and uh, uh, I know that um, Dale does, he used to analyze with, uh, with the Soil Food Web group, so yeah there's a we, we need more of it for sure uh you know it's it's hard it's hard to justify too you're trying to do this good thing for the planet but then you got to get it trucked from the other side of the country and you're just like oh fuck like it's yeah the trucks, it's, the trucks are rolling anyway well yeah they are but you know uh it, the, the more local we can get something the better uh yeah. that's why i yeah i just want to learn how to make it <laughs> Okay, the next one was uh, what you use for termites in your garden beds. I think this is more for Leighton than for, we don't have termites uh, really up here where I am anyway. So Paul Stamets just released us some incredible information uh, as well as a line of inoculants for exactly that uh, problem. So what happens is these spores go inside the ant. They're called zombie ants when the spores hatch. And once you use his product, now it's going to be prevalent in your area and those termites are not going to come back. So just go to Paul Stamets website uh, and get some of that product. There, uh, we got to get, try to get Paul Stamets on here because he's got such amazing information uh, to deal with mycelium and everything that deals with that. But uh, we'll go to perpetual uh, here. We got uh, what uh, was the key AD for living soil? Um, and he says the Malik test. So I guess you have to understand malic is your bank account. So the malic is the high acid test that tells you all of the nutrients that are available locked up in organic form. They're not free and they're not available. Yeah, and it's, it's malic. It's not malic. It's uh, M-E-H-L-I-C-H, uh, malic three test. Sorry. And, then, and then saturated paste is what's mobile in the soil, which is why Lindsay keeps saying, you got to have both. You can't drive on one alone because you, you don't know. I mean, your, your calcium, magnesium, potassium relationship is critical. And so is your total nutrient bank. Because if your nutrient bank is going down, 
and your and your uh, saturated paste is remaining right where it is, you're pulling too much out of the soil, and you need to start to think about replenishing. I think that's the biggest misnomer on that. And then trace minerals, right? It should be chemistry, saturated paste, and then trace minerals and organic matter. You, you need to, yeah, that's a whole nother. Story. Yeah, all, all your trace minerals are are on your Malik three, and and yeah, like Leighton said, your saturated paste test is uh, is a measure of solubility, which it doesn't always equate to bioavailability. It's just like what's soluble in solution. Um, and then your Malik three, like, like Leighton said, is your, is your bank account in the soil. It's your, it's your total nutrient <laughs> pool and your ratios. Yeah. And I, I love what you said. It's not necessarily bioavailable. It isn't, it's mobile. It's going to wash through your soil system, which is why it's so important to have a really high CEC. The higher the CEC, the less likely those nutrients will mobile, will move through the soil. But that, again, it's not directly related to biology. So thank you for saying that. That's a really important point. Well, we got uh, a question on FAA. I'm not sure if he means, uh, are you using an FAA or exactly what, but uh, FAA. Like, like fish, fish aminos? It's fish like, amino yeah, acid. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I, I'm not. Uh, I I know that people really like it. Again, I, I have in the past used some fish hydrolysate, uh, not 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 my own concoction. Um, yeah, some people really like it. I uh, try to minimize my my C inputs. I, I, I will like you know, for example, kelp meal. I will use a little bit, but like I won't use it to get my potassium levels up. I'll use a little bit as a biostimulant uh you know very conservative around that uh i again it's, it's largely a sodium issue potential heavy metal contamination is about minimizing variables and and ocean products unfortunately can vary a lot um yeah yeah and i uh, i'm not i'm not fermenting my own fish currently but i know some people like it i, I think the bears around my place would really like it <laughs> yeah well, you could go down to the local lake and, you know, catch your own and try that, you know. Then you're sure. not having to worry about the sea anyway. Yeah, um, sure, sure. Perpetual I, set uh, versus hydrolysate. Right, and that's what I was going to get into. There's a huge difference because the the natural farming methodology behind FAA is, is you've created an amino. So it's, it's easier for everything to break down or absorb versus a hydrolysate, which is going to take longer. So that's the only real difference between FAA and hydrolysate. Okay, guys. Um, there was one more diggity mentioned. Um, isn't it a type of cordycep fungus? That I'm not sure. Um, again, go to Paul Stamets's website. Dude, I have enough problems trying to keep up with biology. <laughs> I can't get into that one. <laughs> And that was the last question, guys. So um, with that, uh, we can end anytime you would like. Oh, great show today, Lindsay. Ab, as always, absolute pleasure yeah. for working with you. <laughs> and that was phenomenal. Thank you. Thanks, Leighton. Yeah, thanks, guys. Thanks so much for the work that you guys do, just putting the knowledge out there and connecting the community. It's, it's really valuable. I've, I've learned so much from you guys and will continue to, I'm, I'm sure. Well, and uh, Silly Lily says uh, you'll have to come back so Av can ask his hundred questions. Yep, agreed. That's why we're going to? That's why we're going to Edmonton. Uh, <laughs> oh, Billy had a question. Okay, uh, Billy's question: uh, Has Lindy Lindsay ever harvested and applied Forest Edge as uh, Jalam Micro Solution? Yeah. JMS. I, I don't know what Forest Edge JMS is, so no, the answer is no. Is so that sort of like IMO collection or? Yeah, it's the it's the Jadam version of it, so it's okay. a little different than, than the IMO collection. Okay. No, I have not. That's okay. a way. That's a way to build your fungal. Mm -hmm. So basically, think about it this way. Do um, you know what prevailing wind is? Sure. Yeah. Okay, so go to the opposite side of a blowdown or a stone wall, and you notice you'll have a huge pile of leaves because all the leaves blow it, hit the wall, go up over the top, and deposit. So, right back there, if you harvest, pull off the dried stuff, get down into the wet, slimy leaves, 
take that, put it in water, stir it up and apply it. You'll get nematodes, you'll get fungi, you'll get spores, you'll get all of those decomposers that are decomposing mushroom um, fungi that you're looking for. That's a mm -hmm. quick, down and dirty, easy way to do it. And, and yes, perpetual, the, <laughs> uh, the cooked potato is the food source. Hmm. Right. For the yeah. jam Yeah. Yeah. So, um, Av, do you have anything you'd like to add, Lindsay, Layton, for the end of the show? No, it's been great. Uh, I look forward to Av's 100 questions. And, uh, yeah, just kind of continuing the conversation. There's just there's just so much to dig into. I was saying to my partner, she was asking how long this was going to be. I'm like, oh, it's so easy to talk for two hours about this stuff. Like, it's like, <laughs> you know, don't even worry about it. Like, it's uh, we could we could talk for a lot longer, too. But eventually we're going to get hungry here. So. <laughs> uh, yeah. I think, I think uh, we'll, we'll have to have you back and maybe we'll start looking at some Logan lab tests, some a &L lab tests and, and perhaps mm -hmm. some um, uh, maybe Andy's or, or roots and shoots or, or doc tears and, and get a, a real uh, deep dive into some of the analytics of, of this as well. Yeah, Absolutely. that'd be fun. Definitely. So, Av, other than the grow up, do you have anything coming up in your area that your people can reach out and and, and visit you at? Or, uh, we, hey, we're, we've uh, we've got uh, Dustin McLean uh, from Nine Lions coming out to uh, to visit us out here in, in the Maritime. So we're just gonna have a little get together around that. And uh, other than that, it's uh, it's coming close to exam time for my students. So that's where I'm focused on. And, yeah. and marking those exams is where you're going to want to have a couple of bottles of what you were drinking earlier. <laughs> <laughs> they don't pay for that. So. <laughs> <laughs> Layton, do you have anything coming up, brother? No, I just work, eat, and sleep right now. I'm so far behind with all the weather. I mean, thank God it rained like crazy, but it definitely put a stick in my mind for sure. Yeah, yeah. I know for the soil, uh, for the uh, passion within, I have a, a show tomorrow with Mark Parker. Um, he does um, aquaponics and uh, cannabis. And then I actually have the president of the Grow Up, uh, Randy Rowe, coming on Wednesday. And then, of course, uh, I talked to um, John Burfello about coming on and talking about um, curing. And uh, he said, yeah, not a problem. He'd love to come on. So we'll have that coming up uh, soon. We've got um, a gentleman next Monday that uh, Daryl Fay, he's an expert in the endocannabinoid system. And we have um, Dan Kittredge who has rebooked for the third. Um, he, he wants to come on. He just, uh, he had a situation he couldn't last week. So watch for him on the third as well. And he's a big guy. He's a real important one for the community. Yeah. And with that, everybody, I'm going to end the broadcast. We will see That's you fun. next week. Take care. You Thanks, Lindsay. Thanks, Av. Thanks, Bye -bye, Ken. Bye, everybody. <laughs>